You're watching Beyond Market. Welcome, I'm Esther Awuni. Many thanks for joining us. In the first half of today's show, we'll explore ways to harness Africa's gas potential to fix the power challenges. And later on, ahead of the Dubai Expo, CNBC's Middle East correspondent Dan Murphy puts the spotlight on Dubai's young tech entrepreneurs. You can join the conversation on social media. Let me know what you think about the topics we discuss. And to do so, use the hashtag Beyond Market. You can also send me a message to my Twitter handle. It's at Esther O. Awone. And the global CEO of GE Gas Power, Scott Strazik, says gas is a big part of the solution to Africa's energy challenges and the scale, access and dependability of gas is a great catalyst to support renewable sources if Africa is going to create industries and advance manufacturing. I caught up with him and discussed ways to harness Africa's gas potential. As the global leader of our gas power business at GE, it's hard to think of a place to visit that when I'm here and when I leave that I'm not more motivated about what this business represents and what it can do for a part of the world that really needs it. So when you come to a place like Sub-Saharan Africa and from a population perspective it represents less than 20 percent of the world's population but almost 50 percent of the world's population that doesn't have access to consistent reliable power that's something we have to fix. And a lot of our technology solutions are very well suited for that. Whether it be small aeroderivative applications that we can apply quickly to emergency situations or large scale power. And that's represented in the fact that in Sub-Saharan Africa there's about 26 gigawatts of power that's running on gas and about half of that is with GE technology. So that's because we've been here a long time. It's because we're very local and we continue to invest and will continue to invest in a region that we're very committed to. I was going to ask you about uh, 120 years here in Africa. That's a very long time and that's a lot of commitment. But for you, let's talk specifically about you. You've been in the company for 18 plus years. That's right. About 20 years. That's and right. You were, in you, had, you were in previous roles. Uh, I just wanted to know, to what extent have those roles prepared you for this new role? Power in Africa is very tricky. Sure. And you're talking about power in a country like Nigeria, over 200 million people, we're still trying to get it right. While we're still trying to get those power stations you know, to work optimally, yes. now the conversation about renewable energy is coming to the mix. But for GE, you have this technolog technological might. Help us understand how those previous rules prepared you for where you are right now, and just taking on this country and the power challenge. Totally. I mean, I've been with GE about 20 years, and I spent the first part of my career in finance. Uh, from there, I had CFO roles both in aircraft engines and in our power division before I took on first a services leadership role and a commercial role prior to this one. Those all kind of were good complements to becoming the global business leader, but the practical reality is when it comes to doing business in Africa, it takes a village. It takes a little bit from everybody to get things done. And there's different things from those experiences, whether it be the financing to the servicing and the front end of the business commercially, that make me have a strong appreciation for how difficult it is to do things here, but how possible it is if you can create that village and surround it with the right people to solve problems. Fortunately, GE is good at that and motivated to do that, and it's what we're going to do more of on the continent. Speaking about solving problems, uh, you, you probably already knew that sometimes building these mega stations, even gas stations, can take as long as five to eight years. Yeah. In the meantime, power, the power is needed right now. Yeah. But in your opinion, how can Africa leapfrog its energy ambitions? I mean, we're at a time where, like as we mentioned earlier, technology is driving renewables, but the power is still needed right now. How is GE tackling that? It's a game of inches. It's a game of making incremental progress every day. I'm not really a believer that there's one silver bullet to solve the energy problem for countries in Africa or other parts of the world. So how do we use the resources that we have available in different countries and the technology that's available right now and make incremental progress on a consistent basis? The good news with our portfolio is we have applications that can create power very quickly, as short as three months with smaller applications, 30 megawatts, all the way up to applications that do take a couple years to commission and build. It's rare in the case of gas. It takes five, six, seven years. We can do almost anything within two to three years, but even two to three years can feel like a long time when the power is shutting off. So 
how do you build a sequential line of solutions that address near-term problems while still having a view for the future. Speaking about the future, as I mentioned earlier, the renewable energy conversation is gaining more momentum. Yes. We're talking about you know, zero carbon, reducing the gas, et cetera, and looking more to solar and more sustainable yes. or clean energy. And I'm just, just wondering how GE is positioning you know, itself for that. And when you look down the line, look into, look into your crystal ball, if you yes. will, what, is the, what does the future hold for gas? I think in a place like Nigeria, solar, as an example, is incredibly exciting. There is so much remote population that doesn't have access to electricity, and a solar panel here, a solar panel there, can be hugely impactful to those communities and something I'm as excited about as anyone for the impact it can have. But at the end of the day, you can't count on solar 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's not as dependable and as accessible as gas. And if you want to move beyond powering a mobile phone for four hours every day, and you want to authentically create industry and create manufacturing might and incentivize capital to come into your country to create jobs and expand the middle class, you need to know that the power is going to be there every day and that it's going to be there at a cost competitive basis. And the scale and the access and the dependability of gas is a great catalyst to support that. So, I don't view them to be competing dynamics, especially in a place like Africa or Nigeria, because frankly, both are going to be needed. You're going to need things like solar for a lot of the near-term support in remote locations. But if you want to authentically build industry, you're going to need centralized power. And there's no better answer, both economically and for the environment, when it comes to centralized scaled power than gas. So when I look in that crystal ball and look into the future, I see gas as a big part of the solution. Okay, I'm curious to know how it's been, what it's been like for G working with the Nigerian government, I mean, working with successive, successive governments over the years, trying to solve and crack that power yes. uh, problem that we continue to have on the continent. And of course, those partnerships that also help you, especially working on the ground, to help you deploy uh, many of your projects as it were. Just give us a sense of how that's been so far. Now that you're in this sure. role, just help us understand perhaps what, what your plans are, what you bring into the table. Sure. I'd start with the fact that whether it's the government in Nigeria or in other parts of the world, these are governments that have hard jobs. These are not easy solutions to solve. They have many things they're working through, technology alternatives, financing, how they create structures that make things work under a real microscope when it comes to power because ultimately power, the lack thereof of power, is a very personal thing to the person that doesn't have it. So. It's a hard job that they're managing through. The good news is we can help them and are in the process of helping them in different ways. So whether it be helping understand what the options are with fuel to the technology alternatives to financing solutions in a place like Nigeria that has an immense amount of potential, an immense need, we want to lean in and we want to be creative and thoughtful in finding solutions versus reasons not to do business. And that's representative of our gas business, but that's representative of GE, because practically you need the power first, and once you have the power, there's a lot of other industry and a lot of other manufacturing that can follow, so we're motivated to do everything we can to support them. Now, in all the markets here in Africa that you've worked in, I'd like to know what the Nigerian market has taught you so far in terms of just doing the business generally, especially working on the ground. What, is, what has the Nigerian market, how, how, to what extent has it tested the innovation, sure. the technology that you're deploying? In any market, you're trying to uh, create a system in which the cost to generate that electricity, you pass on to the rate base or the payers of that electricity so you can fund it, grow it, make investments, and become more competitive over time. That's what you're hoping any government can do. Hard to do in countries where power is subsidized historically to a large extent. So how do you build a bridge towards converging those two things? What people pay for electricity today versus what it really costs that can give governments enough oxygen to continue to make investments for the long term. That's a challenge for Nigeria today. Governments need to also create systems that are very transparent so that everyone understands what it costs to create electricity that motivates private capital to come in to countries and invest. And Nigeria, relative to many countries in the continent, has had more success with that. There are more independent power producers that are 
evaluating alternatives here to play, and that's because of the steps the government has taken, but because of the size and the magnitude of the problem, we need more of it for everybody involved, and we're motivated to play that role, whether it be direct with the government or with independent power producers that want to come in and make investments in Nigeria, because I think in a country like this, it's going to require both to ultimately be successful. Mm. On the other side of the, t of the continent, in the s south of the continent, South Africa to be exact, there's obviously that problem of the loot shedding. I'd yes. like to hear your thoughts on that and how G, what role G is playing in that? There's a lot we can do. We have an immense amount of history managing through energy emergency crises. It's often involved with our error derivative applications where we'll quickly bring in 30 megawatt machines that will get commission within three months, uh, create power right at the base of where the demand is. And then when things get fixed, we'll mobilize the machines to another part of the country. And we have history of doing that in places like Egypt and places like Algeria. Um, Angola has a number of these machines used for different things that bridge towards future. So in the case of South Africa, I think that's a great solution. But in parallel, South Africa has a need to create more power. They also have a lot of coal today. There's uh, a huge motivation to um, get LNG or gas from outside of the country into South Africa and as that comes into play we've got a lot of solutions that we intend to compete and support the South African government to win. Okay. I know on this trip you also, apart from Nigeria, you're headed, also headed to Cote d'Ivoire, Angola and of course South Africa. Sure. Talk to us about, I mean key takeaways, what are you, what can we, ex what uh, does that trip entail and what are those key focus areas for you? Sure, I mean we're going to uh, the Ivory Coast tomorrow, we're going to spend time at one of our uh, power plants called Azito, incredibly motivating, 700 megawatts of power by the time we're done with the work that we've contracted, that's about a third of the power for the entire country. Um, it's come over time though. We started with a couple gas turbines, invested in upgrades that improve the performance. We're adding a third gas turbine right now. And I think that goes back a little bit to good government policy, which is the game of inches. Sequential progress, no silver bullet. Let's do what we can do with what we have and then build upon it. And the Azito power plant in the Ivory Coast is a perfect example of that, that we're really proud of and committed to. And uh, I'm looking forward to being at the site tomorrow. Now, still looking across the continent and just because I've had several interviews with, you know, analysts, power players across the generation electricity distribution, sure. and I always ask them, do you think that one day Africa, when it comes to providing electricity for its, especially in the rural areas, we will get it right? Do you, do you see that day? Do you, how close are we to get into a place where Africa at least has a good amount of power as a work. It, it's a very, it could, it could be a very, very overwhelming situation. It is actually, yes. if, I'm being, if, I'm, if I'm being honest. But do you see that day? Do you see Africa overcoming that challenge? Obviously with partners like GE, sure. it makes it easier and perhaps sometimes faster we can leapfrog. But just how close are we to that, to that point? We have a long way to go, practically. At the end of the day, we've got to start with places that have the fuel capability, that have things like gas, and make sure they're maximizing it to their potential. And even in those regards, in countries that do have gas, we've got more work to do. In places that don't necessarily have that fuel source, we're going to have to work a little bit harder. It may lead to power pooling in certain countries that do have access to the fuel and having more transmission and distribution across the continent, as an example. Renewables is going to play an incredibly important role. It's not going to be one solution um, because this is a very complicated problem, especially the more landlocked the country becomes and the farther from a fuel source it becomes. But it's certainly a surmountable problem, but one that I think is going to take a lot of stakeholders at play, but one that is achievable. And from General Electric's perspective, one we're going to play an important part in, in helping play our, play our part.